So thanks for joining the webinar today. We have a couple of great speakers for you. Jennifer Deal from the Center for Creative Leadership in San Diego is an internationally recognized expert on generational differences, and she'll be sharing insights from her upcoming book, What Millennials Want from Work. Our own Carol Boer is a hugely experienced learning designer who will be sharing 10 trends in workplace learning that are actually playing to the unique strengths of your millennial leaders. I'm sure you'll have loads of questions to ask. Please type these into the chat box or the question box as and when they occur to you. Don't wait for the Q&A at the end. This is not a uh, physical world event. And I'll feed these into the session at appropriate points. But just um, type them in as soon as you feel like it. We'll be recording the session. So if there's anything you miss, you can come back and take a look at it again on the Lumest Learning website. And we hope you'll use the hashtag, hashtag millennial leaders to share your insights that you glean from your network. Uh, we won't be tweeting ourselves, but we do hope that um, if you want to tweet about it, you can uh, use that hashtag so we can group more together and retweet. So, millennials, originally called Generation Y, just to differentiate them from Generation X, the previous generational co cohort, this lot were going to save the world. Initially, they were lauded for their strong sense of community, both local and global. They were Generation We, the most civic-minded since the generations of the 1930s and 40s. So what went wrong? In 2006, Jean Twenge, I think it was Twenge, presented data showing generational increases in self-esteem, assertiveness, self-importance, and narcissism. So suddenly they were the me generation, or generation me. Then Ron Alsop dubbed them the trophy kids, the most demanding and coddled generation in history. And he also said that they presented organizations with the biggest ma management challenges they've ever encountered. It seems we've become more and more worried by millennials, these lazy, entitled, tech-obsessed narcissists with their social media and their selfie sticks. And now they're the largest single generational, generational cohort in the workforce in assuming leadership positions. So is that going to pan out? Will we experience a leadership gap as these people come to work in organizations actually take management positions in organizations? In a minute, I'm going to hand, over you, hand you over to Jennifer, Jennifer Deal, who's going to address that question. But first, we want to know what you think of the millennials in your organization. So if you can get ready to vote, we're going to drop in a little instant poll here. Um, if you can sort that one out, Lucy. So there we are. Would you say the millennials in your organizations are tickled that apply? Entitled, lazy, unwilling to take responsibility, narcissistic, or perhaps none of the above, the above if you feel a bit more kindly disposed towards them. So um, if you can... Have a think, scratch your head, and then if you can vote now. Okay. And the votes coming in, and when we feel we've got enough votes coming in, we'll close the poll and show the answer. Okay, quite a vote there for entitled. They're not lazy, that's good to hear. They're uh, not unwilling to take responsibility, but they are narcissistic. But 67% say none of the above. Okay, Jennifer, do you, do you have a comment on those results over in San Diego? Well, it's nice to see that people aren't necessarily believing all of the hype about the laziness and the unwillingness to take responsibility. That's good to see, um, as you see from the none of the above. Good. Marvellous. So um, if we'd like to move on to uh, your um, presentation now, i load that up. The truth about millennials. Jennifer, over to you. Okay, so the standard caricature we hear about millennials includes the descriptors that were on the poll. Uh, we hear that millennials are entitled young people who want their parents to manage their careers, want to be paid well to save the world, want praise uh, and promotions for showing up at all, expect work to be fun and interesting and done with friends, expect their technology at work to be just as good as their technology at home, and don't want to work hard. These are things that we hear, and we heard many of these descriptions of millennials, uh, which is why my co-author Alec Levinson and I decided to focus on millennials. And we did research that included 25,000 millennials, either through surveys, interviews, or focus groups, as well as 29,000 non-millennial respondents. And these were from 22 different countries. Now, the picture that emerged from our work is one of apparent contradictions but contradictions that can be effectively managed and even leveraged for better results in the workplace. It turns out that we found that millennials may be entitled, but they're also hardworking. They can be needy at times, while also being strongly independent. Millennials do want to make the world a better place, 
but they may not be willing to sacrifice good pay to get it. They want both and, not either or. They have little patience for outdated technology, yet appreciate the importance of in-person interactions where it makes work more productive and feedback more effective. They're much more committed to their organization than the stereotype would lead you to believe, but also, at the same time, much more willing to walk out the door if not treated appropriately. And most importantly, they aren't that much different from their older colleagues and what they want at work. So let's start with entitled and hardworking. If we can move to the next slide. So millennials are entitled, according to common wisdom. And in some ways, we found that it actually is true. Millennials don't want to do boring work. Who does, right? Uh, they feel it is acceptable to speak up when they have something to say, regardless of who they want to say it to or how much experience they have. They don't think they should be tied to a desk in an office to do their work if it isn't necessary for the work itself. Isn't being able to work away from a desk one of the benefits of technology, they ask. When millennials voice these expectations, older people label them as entitled, yet their expectations aren't substantially different from their older peers. Older people think they should be able to talk with whomever they want, don't want to do boring work either, and want to be able to do their work from anywhere as well. So while millennials may have these attitudes, the reality is that they're also willing to work long hours. They work at least as many hours as their older peers do in the same role. And contrary to the caricature, they expect to have to work hard to achieve what they want. Work is central to their lives, and they spend most of their waking time working, though they say they want to work to live, not live to work. By and large, millennials aren't afraid to ask for what they want. After all, that's what their parents taught them to do. They don't see the point of FaceTime for the sake of FaceTime and think organizational or managerial resistance to flexibility is unreasonable. They perceive themselves as often experiencing extreme work-life imbalance and many feel quite stressed. They believe that technology is often a solution to that stress because of their proficiency at it, which enables them to do work faster and in many cases from wherever they want to be thus allowing them to enjoy a life, as well as have a career that requires them to work long hours to be successful. So millennials are both entitled and hardworking. So let's move on to needy and independent. Now, with all of this asking for flexibility and wanting to be able to express their opinions, many people say that millennials are needy as well as entitled, and they are. If needy is defined as wanting to feel supported and appreciated, wanting to know what they need to do to be successful, and wanting opportunities to learn. And in case you're wondering, their older colleagues want these things as well. Now, while millennials want these options and opportunities, they're also quite independent and have very particular ideas about how leaders should behave. They don't want to be micromanaged. Instead, they want their managers and leaders to act as mentors. They expect leaders to be charismatic and to encourage participation in teamwork, while at the same time being thoughtful about employees' needs and they expect leaders to be transparent and inclusive in their decision making. Millennials also want choices about their work and their learning. They expect to be presented with developmental options rather than just being assigned developmental opportunities. They want to learn and they want choices about how, where, and when they learn, which is helped by technology. Uh, so as you can tell, we found that uh, millennials are both needy and independent. So moving on to high tech and high touch. One of the things that we find to be true about millennials is that on average, they are quite proficient with technology. Managers we spoke with say millennials are obsessed with their high tech toys. And they're right, sort of. The millennials we spoke with told us they would love it if their organization provided them with all of the tech toys they have at home or, or want to have that they don't actually have yet. The newest smartphones, endless connectivity, access to social networking sites, iPads, anything you could think of and a few things I hadn't heard of before. Millennials are willing to be endlessly connected to work via their tech tools and are happy to communicate with others electronically. At the same time, their connections with others are fundamentally more important to them than any particular technology. Because millennials want to feel as if they are part of a community. And that means feeling supported and appreciated by their supervisor and valued by their team. They appreciate having a mentor and have a real need for friends at work. They trust the people they work with more than they do the institutions, including the institutions that employ them typically. They trust the people they're with. 
Though they constantly communicate through technology, they realize that sometimes it's less efficient to do that than working face-to-face is. And getting work done quickly trumps almost everything else because they are always connected to work, and they realize that. So while they may be willing to communicate via technological options, uh, they actually overwhelmingly prefer face-to-face communication for anything critical. So, for example, they don't want important feedback, coaching, or conversations about compensation to take place electronically, or even over the phone. They want it face-to-face because they believe that face-to-face communication is, is really uh, better for these sorts of things. So though millennials may be very proficient with technology, fundamentally, fundament, fundamentally technology is a tool for them uh, that brings them what they want, which is connection and learning. Now, we heard a bunch of jokes about millennials uh, while we were doing this research, and <laughs> one of them was these. How many millennials does it take to change a light bulb? It's unclear because they're still looking for an app for that. And yes, um, the millennials we spoke with were, were almost always looking for a way to use technology to make their work more efficient. They are so proficient with it that it makes sense for them to look for alternative ways to do work, ways that might be more efficient for people who are good with technology. Uh, one example of this, one example of their desire to use technology to improve the efficiency of their work that we heard in four different countries has to do with track changes. Um, and we heard, interestingly, exactly the same complaint. About, um, about track changes versus handwritten notes. The way the complaint went in these different countries was that we'd be talking to a millennial, a uh, younger person, and they would say that what would happen is they would be asked by their boss to create a document. And they would create the document and they would email it to their boss, who was older. And their boss would print it out and write notes on it and hand it back to them, the, the physical paper. And then the millennial would be expected to transcribe those handwritten notes into the, the electronic document. And then they would email it back to their boss, who would then print it out again, write more handwritten notes, and hand the physical paper back to the millennial again. Now, millennials we talked to said that this could go through, they could go through four or five rounds of this. And they found this very frustrating, because they said, you know, some of the time I can't read their writing. Um, you know, I don't understand exactly where they're pointing to. Why don't they just either put the changes and track changes in the document itself or put notes in the document pointing to exactly where they want the changes made, you know, electronically and email it back to me. Why do they keep having to write it all down? It's inefficient. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't use my time well. You know, it, it takes way longer than it needs to. Now, when we went and we talked to the bosses who were doing this, to the older people, what they said was, yeah, they'd, they'd heard the millennials complain about this. They'd heard the younger people complain about this, but they weren't going to do it. And there were two reasons. The first reason was that the primary reason was that this was just more efficient for them, for the older people. Uh, they didn't know track changes very well. Uh, it would just take them longer to do that, and this was efficient. They could print it out and hand it off, and someone else could type it in, and that all worked out for them. Um, they said they understood the argument, but, you know, quite honestly, to, they said they didn't put it quite this bluntly, but basically what they said was, look, my time is worth more to the company than the millennials is, um, and so if someone's time has to be wasted, it should be theirs, not mine. They didn't put it quite that bluntly, but, but that, was the, that was the subtext of what they were saying. Now, in looking through this, and looking through this in all the different countries where we heard this, the four different countries where we heard this, we realized that, that it wasn't that the older people were actually resistant to technology. They talked about all these other new technologies that they were using all the time. And it wasn't that millennials were really excited about using the newest technology all the time. What we figured out was that what was going on underlying this is that people use the process that makes their life easiest and their work most efficient. For millennials, that's often going to use to include technology. For others, it won't necessarily. So millennials aren't necessarily driven to technology for its own sake. They use it because it's easier for them. And this is one example of uh, where they use it because it's easier for them. So that's... So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure. If, any, if anybody has any questions for um, Jennifer on that particular uh, part of the, the uh, webinar, perhaps now would be a good time to put those in. Um, perhaps if I can ask you a question that I have there, Jennifer. I, I think sure. that last um, 
example was a really fascinating one because it shows the dynamic that in a way it slows down technology, technology adoption but um, you know it, it's a fundamental of delegation that the, um, the more expensive person's time is more valuable so the person who has to take more time ought to be the, the person further down the organization but there's a, a real danger here isn't there that we're, we're kind of failing to capitalize on a lot of the uh, capabilities and this incredible proficiency with technology especially when it comes to things like learning because that dynamic is so pervasive yes if in in this case in this case what's being what's stopping the adoption of this this faster way of of iterating on documents is that um, the people who are at, at higher levels in the organization believe that it will take them a long time to become proficient at it. Right. That's, that's really what's, what's stopping it. So the younger people are already proficient at it, but the older people either aren't given space in their calendars to become proficient at it or simply believe it'll take too long um, and, it isn't, and it just isn't worth the time. Yeah, that, 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 that's very interesting. What, what, what you seem to be saying um, overall to me is that um, okay they, the millennials are entitled needy and, and so on but then so are people in, in other age groups as well they, they probably really aren't that different and it may be about life stage or maybe it's about that we're all becoming more entitled needy and, and, and more high-tech but I think what I hear coming out of, of, of your presentation is, is that there is a particular kind of facility around technology which is a, a genuine difference um, they, they've grown up with um, with search, for instance, as a way of getting information, and that, that's something that never existed in the pre-digital age. And so there, there are a kind of, and, and they've grown up using apps and um, smart mobile devices that know where you are and who you are and so on. And, and all this is this is very new, and that that is a distinctive difference. Do you think that's fair enough to say, or am I kind of caricature, caricaturing what you've got to say? There? Well, there certainly is research, not my research, but other people's research, that shows that um, younger people consume information differently than older people do, and that is that is absolutely true. Um, and really, facility with, with technology or with anything, you know, how good you are with anything has to do with how much you practice yeah. and how much you do it. So someone who is older who spends as much time practicing uh, as someone who is younger is likely to have roughly equal facility. But when you start on it when you're really, really young, it's more intuitive. Mm. Um, now, of course, I'm I'm a researcher, so there are bell-shaped curves, and of course, in, there, in every generation, there are people who are going to be more facile with something than than of a different generation. But yeah, on average, the the younger people start you start with different things at different ages, and you just get better and better and better at it. And that's certainly true. It's certainly true that younger people consume information differently, and therefore, we would expect them to be quicker with it. Um, you know, like the search function. Okay, well, hold that thought. I think we'll, we'll be moving on now to um, talking more about kind of learning and, and how millennials learn and learn about leadership um, within organizations. Just like to say, um, Jennifer has very kindly agreed it, um, in, in this presentation to share unpublished um, insights with us from her upcoming book, What Millennials Want From Work, which will be published in January. There's a special discount code you can see on the screen there on the right hand side if, if you go to the URL below and enter that code I think it's on the right hand side of the page um, you'll be able to pre-order the book at a discounted rate I'd love to say that this was an exclusive offer um, it, it is not it'll probably be offered to other people but it, this is the first time that this offer is, is, is being offered so we're very thankful to uh, for, for Jennifer to, to doing that um, so now moving along from there, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. And if you can hang around, Jennifer, um, to, to, to maybe answer questions at the end of the webinar as well, generally. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, so people have, um, in, a, in a kind of panel discussion, so if people have any, any questions that they, they think of later for Jennifer, then we, we can put them then. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm picking up a question here just quickly. Can you bring that up again? Yeah. In the Insight report, Jennifer was quoted as saying that there are only three main differences between millennials and Generation X, more tattoos, more comfortable with tech, or eyesight. Uh, could you elaborate on that? This is a question coming from Sandy McLean. So uh, millennials are more likely to have tattoos than older generations are. This is at least uh, this is something that we've seen in the US um, as being a shift. 
So that's that's the tattoos. Um, we've already talked about the technology, uh, and the uh, eyesight is an interesting is an interesting issue. There's been some research published recently that show that shown a marked increase in nearsightedness in younger people, uh, and it's happened. It's sort of been increasing in the past decade, and it's not just in it's it's not just in the U.S. and it's not just in Western Europe. Um, it's in it's in different. It's all over the world, um, in a lot of different countries around the world. And what the researchers who who've looked at this in detail seem to have found, people people want to attribute it to people spending more time staring at screens, which you know that's sort of the default. You know, there's been an increase yeah. in in mobile devices, so it has to be a result of screens. And what um, my reading of the literature, uh, the most recent pieces that I've seen put out, suggest is that the issue is more about um, is more about younger people not spending enough time in sunlight because there are developmental issues that happen when young people aren't outside enough. So an increase in studying at an earlier age, spending a lot of time indoors, is what they believe to be the difference, uh, the cause of the increase in nearsightedness. Um, and as I said, there's a whole literature on this subject which, which, you, can, which you can search on the internet. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, was, it was an interesting thing to notice because I, like everybody else, assumed that it was a result of um, an increase in use of mobile devices and uh, tablets and those sorts of things. But the researchers who've done actually um, matched groups in different countries um, if, if believe that it's actually a result of basically too much studying inside. So the recommendation is the kids should go outside to study. Yeah, get out there in the park. Exactly. Somebody else has asked, with the track changes, uh, did Jennifer find any managers who were embarrassed because they didn't know how to use the technology, but felt they didn't have the time to experiment and become more proficient? Time yes. pressures of having to do the day job. Again, this is really a learning theme, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that was that was spot on. What we what we heard from people, they were a little bit embarrassed. They weren't a lot embarrassed, uh, yeah. but they were a little bit embarrassed. But they said they basically said exactly what you said. Look, I simply don't have the time. I'm not given the space yeah. to go and learn this. And since time is finite, I have to do what's most efficient so I can get my day job done. Yeah. I got but the impression that a lot of them would actually want to learn it if they were given the space. Hmm. They they simply don't don't have the space, and they don't think their organizations are going to give them the space and time to learn it. Yeah. Okay. And we could we could also referring back to your earlier results, perhaps say they were a little bit embarrassed, not a lot embarrassed, because of course they're all entitled. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. So moving along now, we'd like to drop in another poll if if we can do that, uh, Lucy. Just before I hand over to our next speaker, Carol, who's waiting very patiently here. Um, do you feel that your organization makes effective use of its millennials' ability to use technology for learning? Could you vote now, yes, no, or don't know, please? Do you feel your, your organization makes effective use of its millennials' ability to use technology for learning, this expanded kind of skill set around network technology that they've grown up with? So now if we're going to stop and show that. Yes, it looks like 60% believe not. So the majority of, of us believe that um, there's a slight few there because this has all, all also been our kind of qualitative finding in our report that, um, that we, we, we've uncovered a, a great deal of concern actually among consultants, especially who work in a lot of organizations, that there is a trick being missed here in, in organizations uh, not using that. So if you can hand back to me please, Lucy. Hold on, just a little bit of uh, fiddling around with slides here. And Carol Boa will be telling us now how we leverage the unique skills of millennial learners. Carol, over to you. Thanks, John. So, yeah, that was an interesting poll result there, um, almost split, but the majority saying that um, we're not leveraging the unique skills of millennial learners. I think it's what we're finding is really interesting. There's definitely a shift towards using technology and learning, um, and we've seen some trends coming through, um, certainly in the last couple of years, where we're getting greater use of technology, a wider spread. 
Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that historically using technology platforms was seen as a barrier to learning, but that isn't even a conversation now. You know, the quality and usefulness of the content and the appropriateness of, of what we deliver on, on the technology is now the conversation that we're having. And millennials um, are uh, having a voice. You know, we're hearing a lot more about the learner voice now, that's clear. Um, what we did, if we, if we move on to the next slide, John, what we did actually is conduct our own survey. So we were really interested to um, almost tap into the next generation, so you know, a group of, of students to hear about their own preferences for learning and using technology. Um, and there's, there's a very interesting study that you know, we've published the results on our website. But you know, some of the points that we found were that, that this group um, weren't so much into the technology for the technology's sake. You know, they, when they're learning, they still prefer to take notes. They, they rather write down notes than type notes. Um, they, in terms of finding content, they seek out moderated content. They didn't just search everywhere and, and take anything as read. They, they wanted that content to be trusted and moderated. They, they used trusted apps. Um, and when we talked to them about using phones for learning, they actually um, looked quite horrified and said that they wouldn't ever use their phones for learning. In fact, they find their phones actually quite distracting in a learning environment and would actually put them somewhere else. Now, that's a student perspective, but interesting nonetheless. Um, and then we also talked to them about their preferences. In, you know, they liked easy to use. You know, UX is really, really important to them. They don't like too much text. They don't like too many instructions. Um, and they do like to collaborate. And so they use things like collaborative quizzes uh, and so on, and they, they, they share through Instagram and other, other modes. So that was an interesting insight. And it actually compares, you know, some of the, the findings do compare with um, the learner voice report. So I mentioned earlier that learners have a voice now. And it's interesting that, you know, for the first time towards maturity have actually reached out and surveyed um, learners and represented the the, the learner voice, and I think the findings are really interesting. Um, Jennifer made the point that millennials are more likely to speak up, and yes, uh, 5,700 learners certainly did speak up in this survey. Um, and as, as Jennifer pointed out too, there's no real difference between those generations, but this slide um, shows the findings from the Towards Maturity benchmark, and it does highlight some of the generational differences that they found. Um, I think it's interesting, the motivation for learning was interesting, going back to John's first slide, um, there's a lot of what's in it for me uh, motivation factors in there. And then the final one around, you know, increasing productivity, you know, for the, for the benefit of the organization is less of a driver for millennials and more of a driver for over 50s. Um, I think also where millennials are learning and when is interesting too. So. Um, more millennials are learning at week evenings and weekends, so that's in their own time, um, and less sort of on, the, on their way to work. And so, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, you know, it's just worth reiterating, you, using the technology platforms is not the barrier. Um, it's the quality and usefulness of the content and how it's delivered that, that is, is going to be a barrier. So um, a couple of findings also that match our own is the not using a third not using their their mobile phones for learning, um, and the fact that they like to collaborate, the willingness willingness to collaborate, having the the highest results in the in the uh, towards maturity benchmark, and that's available obviously to everyone via the towards maturity site. So um, just now onto some trends, um, some things that we're seeing um, coming through. Uh, We've always been talking about bite-sized content being the most appropriate way to deliver learning. Um, but I think, again, the learner voice is really speaking out here. You know, they're not, you know, long learning programs are not working for them when delivered by um, e-means. So we are actually generating a lot more bite-sized content, a lot more micro-learning now, the shorter the better. And that's where the value is perceived. Um, we create a lot more explainers now, so animation-based, video-based explainers that deliver really succinct messages, usually in, in less than 90 seconds. So that's the first trend we're seeing, and we're creating a lot more of that sort of learning now. The next trend, um, social learning. Um, it would be good, really, actually, to drop in a poll at this point, because this is something that always really fascinates me, social learning. Um, so, Lucy, if you could just ask the question, that would be great. Do you use social media for learning is the question. Please select yes, no, or don't know. Please vote now. Do you use social media for learning in your organization? 
and we can see the results coming in here. Yep, so let's share that. Our poll results there are, again, it's a 60-40 split, 60 for no. There's no use of social media uh, uh, among 60% of those people. Excellent. So while John's just, just getting the slide back, I think that's, that's really interesting results. I think that um, there is a split there. A lot aren't using it, but some are. And something we've observed, actually, because we've been asked to create social learning environments to support learners, maybe as part of a blended uh, learning approach, but it's quite interesting to look at the adoption rates for social learning. Um, we actually do see quite low adoption rates. But maybe that's something to do with the fact that social learning is um, in a, a formal context. It's not something that's um, appropriate to, to audiences. Um, so maybe it's something that works better if informal. And also recently I've talked to, you know, talked to a couple of clients and, and about their approaches for driving adoption. And you know, there, there has been a lot of pushing. You know, they are actually uh, reaching out to their communities and, and getting them to contribute to, to sites. And I think it's a probably a reflective point for us all. You know, if, we, if we're asked to contribute, or even if we see emails coming through into our books saying that somebody has posted a message, it, it tends to drive us to that social site and it tends to get us to contribute, contribute to um, a discussion. And so I think push is quite important when it, when it comes to social learning. So the next point, um, uh, portals. So um, again, we are seeing an increasing appetite for creating portals. Um, they've certainly grown in popularity. What's interesting here is that they, I guess they started out as a central hub for all things learning related, but now we're creating a lot more subject specific portals or portals focused on specific functional areas. So, you know, apart from the, the sort of community aspect of that, that, that hub, you know, searchability is key. You know, we talked earlier about, um, you know, the need to find things quickly. This generation, you know, know how to search and they expect instant results. And actually, we recently uh, spent a lot of time just, just overhauling a, a portal, an academy that was already in existence, just to create better and more extensive um, search capability and, and functionality. And it, it ties back to the Towards Maturity re re uh, respondents who are saying that um, uh, one of them mentioned that they, the content within their organization wasn't easy to find. So you know, here we have another barrier. So apart from search, you know, again, trusted content is really, really key. And a portal does provide a central space where trusted content can be grouped together. And, and that doesn't have to be created content. It can be curated content as well. OK, and the next, um, the next trend, um, bring your own device we talked about, again, for a long time, before we really started to see it being adopted within organizations. Of course, there were early concerns from IT around you know, security and support around BYOD, but it's happening. And it's, of course, it's going to have to happen if 50% of millennials are learning during evenings and weekends. Clearly, they'll be using their own devices. Um, Often, you know, the home computing setup is more powerful and less restrictive than what's available at work. So we can tap into that. We can take advantage of that. Um, and one millennial client I was talking to recently actually, um, you know, talked about the fact that um, he, he has better technology uh, than the organization he works in. And when I sort of tested out with some of my own colleagues, you know, they, they sort of have an expectation that it should be as good, you know, at work. So I thought that the BYOD point is, is interesting, and we're seeing that um, are coming through a lot more as a trend. And then accreditation. So Learner Voice shows that 64% of millennials are motivated by professional accreditation. That may be, that may be because they're in a very agile, you know, um, working working time. You know, they move around different organisations. Um, and I've certainly um, seen more of an appetite for accreditation. One of our clients is. Um, spent a lot of time promoting uh, learning and um, learning programs and other push incentives that they put into place to get adoption, but still, you know, CPD points um, are still seen as the main motivator for learning and development. Um, push. Um, so now this is an interesting point. So um, you know, we're going from push to pull. Now that sounds sounds a a strange way of positioning because you, you know, in a learning context, you might actually think it's better to be the other way around. But, you know, we do need to market stuff. You know, we do need to uh, create the appetite for for learning. And what I'm seeing now um, is that it's not always about just one intervention to meet a learning need. 
you know, we're often creating more comm style interventions to pull learners into a program. So we might be creating the movie trailers, you know, the coming soon pieces, the mini tasters, um, or even just tackling hearts and minds before a major program launch. But, but you know, it's, it's really about pulling people in and then adopting some of the techniques, I guess, that marketeers would use when um, doing a consumer marketing campaign. Um, and campaign learning is, is a, a phrase that's been coined, I've seen in our industry a number of times. And it's all about mapping those dot drops, those content drops and initiatives against the timeline um, and ensuring that they, they get the best adoption through that. Uh, Another marketing trick, um, TripAdvisor type ratings. So we're seeing these used more and more. People are happy to have their content rated, and you know, that might sit on a learning management system or a learning academy uh, that fronts the program. Um, so I guess it's the learner voice coming through again. You know, how often are we uh, influenced by star ratings when we make a transaction? And uh, I actually heard again from a client recently uh, about an, an aspiration to even retire courses that had lower star ratings. You know, anything with a, a star rating of four and below would be taken off the academy. I thought that was a really interesting concept. Um, so blend, blend is back. Yes, it is back. Um, but the blend's broader. You know, I, I talked earlier about explainers. Yes, it might contain explainers, e-learning, interactive guides, classroom webinars, learning courses, learning sets uh, supported by toolkits. Um, it can be a campaign, as mentioned earlier, a series of events that are, are planned around a timeline. Um, but the important thing for the blend is the glue. It's the glue that holds it all together. That could be your learning hub, it could be your subject specific academy, it could be many things, it could be your app stores, it could be a channel, um, it could even be a book, an interactive learning book that provides you the links and the guidance to the various learning resources you need to complete a program. Or it could just be a curation tool. Um, and the learning resources may be created specifically or even curated from existing and trusted content options. So, you know, when we look at things like, you know, YouTube um, to provide, you know, learning messages. And again, that is that trusted point. If you've created it, presumably you trust it. Okay, so I think I've covered all my 10 trends. There's a summary there. Uh, no, I think I've got, oh, got two one more, go. two more to go. Yeah, okay. don't get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so mobile. Um, so we are um, seeing more and more uh, requests coming in now for mobile learning. Um, it's interesting that the drivers around this, they're, they're less around the fact that an organization is uh, prepping for uh, their millennials are more around a strategy. You know, they need to reach, you know, globally dispersed workforces or workforces um, where technology might be slightly restrictive in certain, certain, certain places. So mobile is a solution to that. But again, it's appropriate use of technology um, for that audience. And performance support. Um, so it's not just about the, um, as I said before, the initial intervention that delivers the learning, more and more we're being asked to consider how we how we embed the learning and, and performance support is key. Apps are great for that, um, L books are great for that, interactive books that help people to embed the learning in the workplace and thinking beyond the course, you know, the, the hubs that deliver the learning um, will still be used beyond the course for providing up-to-date and relevant information to support a community. Marvellous and uh, there's a summary. Um, if you could uh, now type in your questions, uh, either for um, Carol or for Jennifer, or, or for both, in fact. Um, and I'd like to kick off by asking uh, about this. We talked about you talked about social learning, Carol. Yeah. And you hear we hear reports that the, the, the kind of social networking that organisations set up, rather than the, that comes about bottom up and spontaneously, tends not to get used. Mm. Have you seen it? I mean, yeah. I've heard it called the creepy treehouse effect. Yeah, and it's that's that. Absolutely true. I mean, in some cases, you can have, you know, some terrible statistics, almost a zero percent adoption of social learning channels, um, and it, it, there's a trick, I guess, to getting that adoption happening. Um, I've also seen social learning and informal learning as terms used almost interchangeably, which is actually incorrect because social learning is just a method of, of learning, and it can be informal or formal. So, um, I. I, the, the lady I spoke to, the client I spoke to, who was achieving great success, was, was using the stick approach. She was talking to managers. She was getting them to commit to post regularly. She was aligning social learning um, interventions to 
uh, classroom um, activities um, to other learning interventions and activities. And, and by doing that, she got massive adoption rates. Um, but if, if you just build it, they will not come. It yeah, I think work. any marketer would tell you that, that you know, the, the trouble that you have to kind of get your, it's not just about setting up your Twitter account, you also have to work very hard to kind of build your yeah. traffic and so on, and, and so I suppose that carries on through. And also, you, in, in perhaps a wider, um, a, a more broad brush kind of way, you talked about the blend, and it seems that what you're saying there is, is, is in a way that we no longer have the spine offered by a course. It always used to be that there was a training course of some sort, either online or offline. Mm -hmm. But that now seems to be disappearing with this trend towards bite size is the right size. Mm -hmm. So what is the glue that holds that together? Now, now that, that's quite interesting. Does that throw a lot of um, emphasis on L&D people having to learn how to design these campaigns? And, and where do they get the knowledge to do that? From and the yeah, I think insights. I think it comes back to the learner voice. Um, that's absolutely key. You know, if if you know that your you know particular learning initiative, you know, is not going to land that well because it's, it's responding to a major change program, for example, then you need to plan it like a campaign. You need to you need to tap into focus group results. You find out what the um, what the learners are thinking and feeling, and and then respond accordingly. When you've done that, you might then survey them again, and you might actually even design your interventions based on some of that feedback. So it's not unusual in a campaign-based approach to not have a clear vision of what each of the stages will look like. You might have an you might have a stage where you regroup and then design the next intervention based on those results, and and that is a proper campaign. I think that's something we can go into a bit more detail in in, in future webinars. I'd like I'd like, to, um, I'd like to bring Jennifer back in here uh, in a way. Um, I think what, what I've heard, what we found during the preparation of the report is that um, we, we've heard about companies where people have had to design stuff like this for their millennials as a particular group because they, they just weren't engaging. And that they found that it's gave them the, given them the ability to, um, to have an excuse if, to, to pilot this stuff with, in organizations, but also it's had a wider beneficial effect for other cohorts, as, as it were. The older people benefit from that too. Um, I wonder if you have any sort of comment of, about that, the introduction of um, learning technologies within the workplace. Yeah, I think that the, the, these, these learning technologies have been things that people have been asking for for a long time. And in some ways, millennials provide an excuse for organizations to uh, do it more. Uh, and everybody benefits when people can have access to learning that benefits them directly on the job, which is quick and easy and under, easy to understand and straightforward um, and really truly useful. Everybody benefits from that, absolutely. And so I would expect there to be just as much uh, uptake on the from the older generations as from millennials, regardless of the uh, the way the information is delivered. Not any more questions before we sign off here? I think um, but we don't have many coming in. It, it looks as if we talked you into certification and you completely agree with everything we've said. <laughs> Perhaps it's now time to sign on as, as we um, have reached the end of our sign off, as we've now reached the end of our time slot. I'd like to give a big thanks to both our speakers for giving us a really interesting session today, thank, uh, particularly to Jennifer for joining us from San Diego at the beginning of her day and us at the end of our day. Um, and all the people who gave us their questions when we went along, those, those, so we have a, a very interesting and, and insightful. Um, that isn't the end of it. Um, if um, any of the issues we talked about today resonate with you um, and you'd like to have somebody to talk to, as they say on the radio, um, you can email us at learning uh, at lumes.com and um, you can talk to one of our hand-picked consultants uh, who can talk about your own issues with millennials, leadership, and learning. Um, please follow us on Twitter at uh, Lumes underscore learn and read our blog, the um, lumeslearning.com slash blog um, as we continue to explore. Uh, I think we've just published the executive summary for, for the report. So there's stuff coming out all the time of, about millennials and we'll soon be moving on to a bit more of the stuff that Carol was talking about, about how do you, you know, in a course, beyond the course world, how do you find the glue that um, sticks learning interventions together um, in, in this new type of blend? Uh, and remember the hashtag Millennial Leaders if you want to share these insights anywhere. Um, and there will be a recording of uh, the slide deck 
yet, which uh, will be uh, readily available on the website in, in the resources section. Okay. Yep, and possibly through the, through the blog as well. So thanks for that, Sandy. And with that, um, I think we have to say thank you very much and good night. And thanks everyone involved. <laughs>